Um, I want to invite you to check out some more upcoming events, which are also collaborations between the store and the library. Um, next week, we will talk with the authors of a book called Testosterone, an unauthorized biography about all there is to know and all that's um, commonly gotten wrong about this important hormone. Um, that's on Wednesday. And on Thursday of next week, we will be uh, discussing the problem of gerrymandering and also what can be done about it with Dave Daly and uh, Sam Wang. And to register for these and for other events, you can follow uh, Labyrinth or the library uh, on this Crowdcast platform or on our respective Facebook pages, of course. And you can also sign up uh, uh, for the libraries or the or Labyrinth newsletter, uh, which are both once a week newsletters um, on our respective uh, websites. And you'll get one yeah one one um, email a week, letting you know what's uh, coming up. And then uh, another practical thing, I of course want you to know um, how to order Charlotte's This Brilliant Darkness and Hones the Inner, uh, Inner Coast from Labyrinth Books or from some of you might be uh, joining us from Jeff's and Donovan's hometowns, uh, each of which has wonderful independent bookstores, the Norwich bookstore, uh, Literati. Um, so whichever bookstore is near, independent bookstore is near and dear to you, uh, we all need your support right now. Um, but if you do want to order it from Labyrinth or one of them, both of them from Labyrinth, I have put information about that in the chat. Um, and they will ship for free and you'll get 10% off. The best way would be to send us an email to orders.labyrinthbooks at gmail.com or to give us a, a call during our uh, phone hours. And online, online orders will ship for free in Jersey and are 10% off for members. So all of this is in the chat um, and also on our, on our homepage at uh, labyrinthbooks.com. Just a quick word about that chat. I'm going to take uh, the chat feed down during the conversation itself, and then I will bring it back up uh, during the Q&A. But I want to ask you not actually to, to use the chat uh, feed for your questions. Um, instead, on this platform, there's an ask a question button in the middle at the bottom of your screen. And you can just type questions in there. Um, and if you see something in the queue already that interests you as well, there's an arrow on the side of those questions and you can upvote that. Um, and that way we can see that uh, there's a topic that interests um, more of you and pay attention to that in particular. So we will be sure to leave uh, plenty of time for the Q&A and I encourage you just to add your questions as you have them uh, to the queue uh, during, during our conversation. Um, but now on to our guests who are waiting in the wings, I'll bring them up soon. We started planning uh, this event as a conversation with Donovan Hone whose book of essays, uh, The Inner Coast, here it is, has just come out. Donovan is the author of uh, the acclaimed and best-selling um, book, Moby Duck, the true story of 28,800 bath toys lost at sea and of the beachcombers, oceanographers, and fools, including the author <laughs> who went in search of them. Um, so in my line of work, you see a lot of uh, titles in including a lot of long book titles. Few are quite this long, but it's a great title, um, not least because it gives a snapshot of the kind of range of interests and, and, and the deep curiosity that drive Donovan's work. Um, he is recipient of several um, prestigious fellowships and awards. His essays have appeared in many major journals and magazines, too many to list, uh, all of that you can easily look up. Um, and he was a longtime editor also at GQ. Donovan has taught nonfiction in the MFA program at the University of Michigan and is now on the writing faculty um, of Wayne State University in Detroit. And I am uh, so thrilled, really, that Donovan had the thought of inviting Jeff Charlotte along uh, for tonight's conversation. Um, Jeff is a nationally best-selling author and an editor of um, six books of literary journalism, including uh, The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, 
which was described uh, by none other than Barbara Ehrenreich as one of the most compelling and brilliantly researched exposés you'll ever read. He's also the author of uh, Sweet Heaven When I Die. And for that, critics put him in the company of Joan Didion, Norman Mailer, and John McPhee. Jeff is a, a contributing editor to um, for Harper's, for Rolling Stone, Virginia Quarterly, um, and a contributor uh, to GQ, where Donovan edited his work. I don't know whether they met there, but they certainly crossed paths there. Um, he teaches writing in the English department at, uh, at Dartmouth College. And that association um, that I just mentioned with John McPhee, to my mind, that might be um, a sort of uh, uh, one of the hinges around which Jeff and Donovan swing into each other's territory as essayists and uh, as reporters. But what they most seem to share um, is a commitment to and a gift for, for dignifying and uh, for helping us to see what's easily overlooked but, hold, but hiding in plain sight. Jeff is uh, a reader of other people's unfinished tattoos. Donovan is an explorer of hinterlands. Uh, both appear um, to take as their compass the, the, the strength of the affection that they can bring to their encounters along the way. So let's hear from them now. I'm going to minimize myself and bring them up, which is gonna take just one second. Um, hang on, bear with me. Where are you guys? Here. Here we go. Hi, Jeff. And hi, Donovan. And I'm gonna hot go. Hi. <laughs> okay, welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just start by saying a few quick thank yous of my own. Um, when we planned this, uh, uh, book launch back in January. I th think, Jeff, you were going to be doing book events on the East Coast mostly. Um, I was supposed to be road tripping around the Midwest and the West Coast. Um, and, and then in March with the pandemic, uh, we started learning how to do virtual book events, which is um, a strange and new experience for me. Um, but I'm really grateful to Dorothea and Labyrinth Books uh, for playing um, uh, oh, the IT department and impresario at the same time. Um, thank you, Jeff, for coming here. And thank you to, to those attending um, in the middle of a moment where much has been um, both foreseen and unforeseen. But I, I was thinking, um, Jeff, uh, that tonight we might both start with reading something very short, because I do liked I want to hear your language and you know I, I think we both think about sentences um, a bunch um, but I think another thing along with those um, notes that Dorothea gave us that hinges between our work I like that um, uh, both of our books these particular books they're both kind of collections that I think play variations on theme the, the different parts move together, but they also are, uh, there's a kind of a movement from the private and personal experience to something more public. Uh, there's a kind of movement from the, from the internal to the external, I think, in them. So I thought we could both read something short that's in that personal essay mode um, a little bit more, or meditative mode. Do you want to start? Yours? Well, no, I, I actually I want to set you up because I I I, I yeah. want to ask you to start, and and the reason why I want to ask you to start is because um, uh, I, I you know I'm just going to hold up Donovan's book again. Um, this is such a you, we we call it collection, and there's that idea that collections are sort of like we gather things up, but this book has a has a deep sense of intentionality to it. These, these essays flow together, but I think about I like to imagine a time when we can all be in bookstores again and bricks and mortar and 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 though I don't like to imagine anyone who doesn't know your writing, Donovan, I still, I know there are a few out there and I like to imagine someone picking up, because it's an incredible cover and picking this up and reading this <laughs> sentence. And for me, I if I read this sentence, that's it. I would buy the book. And 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 so I, I was hoping that you would start us off with, with that passage. I know you, you were 
are thinking of sharing with us. This is actually the oldest essay in the book. Um, and yet I, uh, it, uh, many of the, the preoccupations in the collection are kind of there in an incipient um, uh, way. It's called snail picking. I was, at age nine, a god of snails. On the quiet San Francisco cul-de-sac where my family lived, Helix Aspersa, the brown snail, was by far the most plentiful and least evasive wildlife around. Snails plied the long green fins of our neighbors' agapanthus like barges transiting green canals. I'd, I'd unglue them from their shiny trails hold them in midair and poke their sensitive horns. They'd ripple and recoil. Usually I'd show mercy, restoring them to their universe of leaves, but sometimes I'd hurl them hard against a garage door where they left Icarus spots. Snails were pests after all. Other times I'd launch them high above the telephone wires Diminishing as they rose, they'd hang suspended for a moment at the apogee of gravity's arc, little spinning cosmonauts, brown specks on a canvas sky. Watching them, I tried to imagine how it might feel ganglia lit up like filaments in that last astonished instant before they fell. Did they experience snail terror, snail rapture, or were they too dumb and dizzy to experience anything at all? Afterward, on the asphalt, the shad bubbles of their bodies, veiny and blue, reminded me of the skinned testicle I'd glimpsed while browsing my father's medical books. One day, I filled a half-gallon margarine tub with snails, took them home, and set them on my nightstand. Glowing jars of fireflies were for other children. For me, a tub of snails. They climbed the white, translucent walls and clung to the underside of the perforated lid. From my pillow, before turning out my light, I could see their dark forms moving around like thoughts. When I awoke the next morning, the lid was off, and the tub, save for a dozen gray squiggles of turd, only after opening the curtains did I spy the slow explosion happening all over my bedroom walls the small armada, the wakes of light. Oh, that's, that, that's, that's gorgeous. And even hearing you read it out loud again, having, um, having now finished the book, I have a greater appreciation for how much of the structure of the inner coast is, is, is sort of coiled in that, in that opening page and a half, the slow explosion, the way that things are always in motion as you take us through waterways and through time and so on, and the wakes of light. Uh, it's it's really and it's interesting for, to hear you say that that's the earliest essay because it's it almost reads as if um, uh, I could imagine you putting this whole book together and then saying I need something to open this and 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 writing it for that but that shows that. that shows the way in which um, books that I love that that reveal to me and writers that I deeply admire that reveal to me these currents that the that that run through their work uh, and animate it. Thank you. That was really gorgeous. Well, well, I'll just ask before uh, there's one I would like to hear you read a short one. Um, but but don't you find? I mean, I know I'm teaching nonfiction. Um, one of the first things I ask my students to do is to make like just a list of things that fascinate them, even if they they don't know why. And things are things that have fascinated them since childhood. Um, and I do think that sometimes we choose our subjects to write about in nonfiction but in some weird mysterious way they choose us so even if you're even if you're not intentionally um trying to orchestrate the preoccupations in a collection of essays they, they almost you almost can't escape them i don't know I mean, if you found that to be to be true in yours um because yours does we do we move in a lot of I mean, we've got landscape in yours we've got a lot of portraiture we even have some at times things that feels like media criticism where we're like trying to make sense of this, of this, um, of, of the kind of um, 
the experience of the virtual image as this form that's both extremely intimate and yet extremely distant, um, kind of like this experience, I suppose. Um, so, so there's this huge range, but I do feel like there are certain things, the, 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 the kind of nocturnal element all the rest that, that are that are that, that play and you're doing something else which is you've got formal pattern with image and prose so you're bringing images into conversation with your own essays but, but would you read the one about the irises as yeah. a nice just short short prose poemy essay yeah and, and you know and, and i like what you say because there's an extent there's sometimes i think um uh, we both go back and forth between writing uh, about other people's lives and writing about our own lives. And there can be an assumption um, in literary circles sometimes that only memoir is personal writing. And I always think if you invest so deeply, whether it's in that piece of memoir that you have there or as, as you do in the book, you profile some other people, that's time, that's part of your life. Those people become part of your life. So I, I like the way that kind of back and forth can reveal um, uh, the personal is seemingly the distant and, and also um, the distant that is in the personal. So maybe this piece does the latter. Um, the book is, is, um, is gonna be very low tech. We all miss bricks and mortars bookstores when we miss real books. This is a book of photographs, but I'm not gonna digital it for you because we couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, uh, these are irises down um, the down uh, the road from my house where I live in Vermont. The book moves back and forth uh, uh, between people sort of around the world. Two years of reporting, book ended by a, my father's heart attack at the beginning, mine at the end, um, and always sort of returning to this field and these irises. I thought they were wild, but I'm told irises rarely are. Planted, invasive, European mostly or Asian, but there are native flowers too. These with their ribbed yellow tongues resemble an iris called the wild flag, which grows from Vancouver to Sitka. How might they have come to this small Vermont Valley? First a bulb, then a garden, then flowers, planted. Now, flowers, wild. Escapees or refugees, invaders or simply the left behind. Every foot of land along this road has been cultivated at some point or another during the past 220 years and maybe much longer. Crops or sheep or swine or just a pretty field. Maybe before the beavers who turned the field for a time into a swamp, before the beavers were hunted and the swamp became again a field. Maybe before the swamp, but after the wild, this was a garden. We could sift the soil, search for a shard, a shell casing, maybe bird bones preserved by the still swampy ground, relics of a funeral conducted by a child like that of the goldfinch my daughter buried beneath our lilacs a few miles up the road. To found, find out, I'd have to uproot these purple strangers and there's a mist slipping in from the trees. And because I've been memorizing Yeats's The Stolen Child so I can sing it at night with my daughter who has claimed a piece of the poem as her own, she claimed she wrote this. She just she memorized it and then claimed it. It's a nice way to approach poetry. Come away, oh human child, to the waters in the wild. Because I've been preserving these words as well. I imagine the mist speaks. Take your picture and leave. This isn't your field. These aren't your flowers. I chase the mist. I try to step within. It says, I'm not your mist. No. And I'm not even my own. Nothing is. I crouch to pick an iris for my daughter, Rosie, which is not her real name. But then the mist swells like a whale breaching and disagrees. Field, swamp, garden, sheep and beavers and flowers, people who plant, people who wade through ticks and tall grass as the evening earth exhales. The mist moves, always. Let the irises be, it says. Pretend that they're wild. Forget where they came from. Did you, Jeff? Did you? Did you ever? Um, were you ever a poet? Never. Did you? Ever <laughs> um, never. But I. Uh, it, it's interesting. Um, 
I read it. I, I think I'm I, I think I'm the sort of the rarest of people who read poetry and has never written a poem. Um, uh, and I think I was lucky in, in having a, a, a mother who uh, sort of told me to do that, and, and a father too. Who actually, when I was a child, he made us. And this is the book begins with this. He made us memorize um, Emily Dickinson because I would not stop for death, which I don't have memorized anymore. Um, and Yeats has slipped away too. But, uh, it's interesting, and and because I remember when we were sort of emailing back and forth about your books, and you, you talked about one of the things I think about poetry is. And the, the poets I admire is the time you take with their work. And you talked about in your work, sort of really lingering on the line, uh, and and the pleasure. And and I'm yeah, part, part, yeah. Well, part of that's just I'm neurotic. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Just revised neur neuro neurotically. That's you know. Um, but in here, you uh, find no. You find, I don't. Doesn't it doesn't always feel like a good. What's that? I, th I think in doing so, you find so much that, and, and we both know this because we work together as editor and writer and that sometimes you have to do things on the fly and you can find a good line and so on, but you let yourself get away with a lot of lines that are just like, okay, that'll do. Um, mm -hmm. And what I love about the inner coast is you haven't let yourself get away with anything. Every line is is there for a reason. Um, and, and I imagine some of them took you a while. I sort of wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, there's that that famous story about uh, uh, Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen, and I can't remember which song um, uh, Dylan wrote in a, a few minutes. And Leonard Cohen, it took him 12 years or whatever to write "Hallelujah." Um, <laughs> I can't remember the Dylan song, so there you go. Um, uh, yeah, can you tell me about some of the lines that you lingered on for a long time and and that that changed? Um, I'll try. I mean, so the, the I was out kind of wondering if you'd ever even privately, secretively in a diary written poems, only because the, the movement of the Iris essay that you, that you I, I said it's like a prose poem, but it really actually is. It's there's, whenever I think about poetry, and I'm a lapsed poet, I, 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 I felt I learned I was much more at home in the sentence, even though I, I tried very hard to, to do poetry. And there's a real I think there's a there is to me a, something there's a different feel to the sentence of the line, and, and you learn which one you're most at home in. But your this this Iris essay, I just I love that that you know like just the it's got within one page you take us it's you're not traveling on on your feet you're out there static narratively you're motionless. But within what's happening in the prose, because it's happening kind of meditatively internally, there's a huge amount of movement. We go on this like journey, and there's even movement in the way you're speaking. Like, like that last lyrical paragraph is this this swerve in the voice um, that sounds it's heightened. It's almost magical or prayerful in that last paragraph. And those are all the well, moves that. that the kinds of moves that many poets might make. So I was wondering, but I've, my own lines, geez. I mean, so the, that first, uh, the short bed snail picking actually did begin as a poem. Hmm. Um, uh, um, I, while I was depressed, melancholic in an office job, I won't say which, unhappy and kind of stealing time from my employer, I started playing with these, I had a, it's kind of, a sequence of poems that were kind of about about certain I like when I do I don't I don't really think of myself as a nature writer because I, I do I like to write about people um, you know there's a, that can be kind of a constraining term but when I do write about nature I like the ordinary uh, nature so like I like to think about about um, the natural world that hasn't been kind of mystified or, or, or sentimentalized in certain ways so snails are they're kind of the fun they're fun to think about. That was a poem, and you know, I for me, it's it's it was it was playing out of the way you do as a in a poet with line, and then and then shifting to see what happens when you move into paragraph and sentence. And it's for me, it slowed down the tempo of lyricism in a way that I actually think was good. Sometimes when you write in a line, it can speed it up. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking very much about about getting the 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 tempo and it's right. Um, um, so. Pick one of my own favorite sentences, though, because that's embarrassing. So, um, it's uh, interesting about nature writing, because you know, I was—I—I uh, I, I told you uh, 
during this pandemic, I, I, it's, I find it hard to finish a book unless it was on a deadline. And so I spent this afternoon and where I live on this dirt road, I spent this just sort of walking around reading this book and, and then I would pause and I'd start thinking about, uh, uh, you know, I could, I could build a class around this. Um, I, I could build a course. Uh, we, we both teach writing and I'm thinking about sort of nature writing for people who don't like nature writing. Um, it's good. I like it. And uh, um, and trying to think about what what this is, and 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 you know we both we both are starting th uh, this this event with some some what to other people might just seem like nature writing, but there's a uh, I, I wonder if I can put this sort of like uh, we both also have an aversion and a wariness of that which is called nature writing. Um, I wonder if you could say more about what that is for you. And, and, and how this takes you from, from the snail and the tub to that moment toward the end where you're pushing a shopping cart as a young child. You wouldn't do this as an adult off a cliff just so you can see it go crashing yeah. down into the ocean, um, which is a kind of nature writing as well. Yeah, they, I mean, there's a, there, this is a topic that I could uh, probably have started talking about um, a half an hour ago and used up all of our time because it's one of the things I think a lot about. I was, I'm really fascinated by going back to the, the earliest in our recorded histories of the ways that maybe Americans in particular have attempted to imagine the natural world. Because I think there's a, there's a kind of innocent nature writing that that is that does not bring history mm -hmm. into the encounter with the natural and if you and we can just we might pretend we're a positivist writing with, with the objectivity of a scientist or we we might be just communing but for me i feel like history is always present it's present both these days in the 21st century the anthropocene because we're everywhere. I mean, the idea of the natural as, a, as somehow separate from the human, I think, is very hard to sustain. But I also think if you read the history of nature writing, you can see history in all of it. Like somebody, if you have somebody trying to describe a landscape, try to describe a tree, like we can date like where it's from. And one of the things actually I really liked about the irises too, and this is something that I was thinking a lot about in, in this particular book, was the idea of the essayist excavating geographies and you you do that in the iris thing you start moving into imagining the past this field so instead of just encountering an iris we're now encountering like trying to bring into consciousness the history of of this place if i had a course title i actually want to steal one from that dorothea mentioned from before we went on air which is saying that both of these books are are, are like guidebooks of attentive practice Mm -hmm. which yeah. which actually I think that that does a lot and and so so that's the paying of, of attention whether it's to a landscape but also to other people which brings in but it's a different kind of experience because now there's as I know you've talked about the art of the interview as a kind of collaborative act at times right yeah. if I'm not misremembering yeah. and that's different then right because with it when you're when we're writing if I'm writing about snails or you're writing about irises that element of collaboration isn't really there right we almost have to try to find ways to to, to make it there um, so i think we should sh share a little bit of the other parts of our books that are kind of moving out from these more private or meditative encounters to i do think of it as almost like going in like a series of concentric circles that are trying to make sense of of the private and then moving out because all of our lives are entangled with history and place and other lives, right? It's it's all connected. That's maybe the slightly ecological way I sometimes think about things. Yeah, but I do I, want us to get out there. Let's let's do some of that. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's, let me ask you about that because in that sense, you say you know uh, snails or irises, we can't really collaborate with them. And no, we're not. But we're collaborating with the stories that are told about them, and that also yeah. that that deeper history, which is one of the sort of the elements of media criticism that I think about. Um, all the time is the way journalism tends to frame events in a very narrow window of the now that uh, most of the time doesn't allow us to see perspective or will grab one historical parallel that will be sort of too neatly attached as opposed to what you're emphasizing throughout this book and, and this metaphor of rivers that runs through it and your own deep attachment to rivers. Um, you know, the, the discovery that I learned from the book that the Great Lakes are, are, are 
really just sort of part of one long river. Um, and that rivers, you write, uh, actually don't really have beginnings and ends any more than stories. So how do you tell a story when you start to recognize that and to say, to tell this thing, we need to know about that deeper history. And, and that's, that's what you then take and, and one of the, and maybe I'll sort of set you up for this because as you move out and you sort of follow the course of the river, what um, it, it's almost, if a, if a reader didn't know, I almost sort of wonder if they would have seen it coming. So wait a minute, when when is he gonna come? There's a way in which we in the United States have been thinking about water a lot, right? Which is, what does water say to drink in the way that in Flint, Michigan, it made it visible. You follow the water to Flint. Um, and by the time we get there, um, and we've taken this lyrical route and we've looked at water flowing and now you're saying, but there's also water we have to drink. Um, so that, you, you are, you're not in a collaboration with the water, but you, we're always in collaboration with all the people around these na natural things. And that makes that, I see that, that Flint material is just as much nature writing as, as the snails or nature writing that isn't nature. Yeah, well, because I do think there's a way in which we've, 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 you know, the, because of technology, not, not terribly new technology, but the, through artificial plumbing, there's a way in which we've, we have turned the natural experience of water, which was at the center of human experience, just like forever. Um, um, it's, it's in all the maps and it's in it's how people organize their lives. It's it's become now at the end of our consciousness like it's become this mysterious substance that comes we don't know where it comes from we don't see it so there is that that desire to try to make it make visible what's not invisible and then there's also a little this is maybe the one the little thing that i've kept from my early love of the transcendentalists was they had this notion of of changing your point of view that in order to see clearly you have to you just have change the angle at which you're looking at something. So I was thinking about what if we try to think about America, but but from the rivers, which have or which many of them, certainly in places like the industrialized Midwest or the Northeast, have become very um, uh, domesticated. They're very urban. They're contained. They're hidden away from our waterfronts. So that was one of the projects. So I'm going to read a little bit from an essay called Watermarks that I really is about water and it's about the history of writing about water, but I wanted it to itself be very fluid. I wanted I wanted that wanted there to be a kind of like like I mean we, we talk about flow and prose as a kind of a cliche, but I really wanted to think about like how can you make something that feels that the essay becomes moves in that kind of sinuous um, uh, have that muscular, sinuous in, uh, motion that water does as it moves. I, I don't know if I hit it, but I'll, I'll give a section of it. And it does, it's going to take us to Michigan. Um, these days I live in Southeast Michigan, which is to say I dwell in a watershed of paradox. Here we are at the edge of the Great Lakes, which together contain 84% of North America's and 20% of the world's accessible fresh water. The Great Lakes are puddles of glacial melt, Rainfall and tributaries contribute only 1% of their total volume. Much of the rest is fossil water, sequestered from the water cycle since the last ice age. I love the phrase fossil water somehow. Under a recently issued state permit, the Nestle Corporation, a major purveyor of bottled water, can now draw up to 400 gallons of Michigan groundwater per minute for just $100 a year. And yet in Flint, people now regard their faucets with warranted suspicion. And in Detroit, whose water treatment plant was spared the people of Flint from mass poisoning, the water company has been turning the spigots off, letting their delinquent customers go thirsty or purchase bottled water from Nestle. During the federal emergency in Flint, I spent some time in the city following a team of civil engineers conducting an investigation. I watched contractors excavated a res residential street, extracting a service line from under the asphalt. The line, a few dozen yards of copper pipe, was evidence at a crime scene, and the scientists labeled it with forensic care. Looking at it coiled on a sun-dappled lawn, dirt still clinging to the copper, I experienced a feeling that I later recognized as disenchantment. What I couldn't get over was how small the pipe's diameter was. The three quarters of an inch, this was it, the source of the everyday magic. For most of my life, running water had been one of those technologies like the telephone or electric light that I took for granted. Where the water came, 
from from and where it went when it gurgled down the drain were both mysteries that only rarely wondered about. Living in the age of indoor plumbing is a bit like living beside a stream whose headwaters and mouth are distant rumors. The waterworks of wealthy nations, or at least those of certain zip codes, are a kind of man-made river leaf. An imperial, in imperial Rome, the aqueduct was a public monument as well as an engineering feat. Buried underground, our own, under, our own aqueducts invite forgetting. I'm going to stop at that moment. I think there's more in this vein, but I want to make sure. I want. Um, I feel like there's um, people can read more. The I want to hear. Um, I want to hear um, uh, from one of. I don't want to uh, lose. Take, take take too much time away from the the other piece. I'd like you to share with us, yeah. um, which is um, which is about a. Um, a, a murder by the police. Yeah, it is. In, uh, Los Angeles in 2015. And it's um, perhaps uh, a murder that maybe got less attention than some, um, uh, but maybe you can fill us in on what we need to know. Um, but why don't you introduce us to Charlie? Yeah. Um, and for me, I guess the one thing I'd say, which is rereading this essay in preparation to me, is I, I was thinking, it's, it seemed to make a really difficult piece to write, actually. And what it felt to me, the beauty in it for me lay, lies in that there's a, there is a, a kind of, I think there's a, a, a subtext of, of, of rage almost, or certainly a protest um, under the prose. But the way it's communicated is through elegy, mm -hmm. portraiture, and witness, I think is how I think about it. Um, but would you share this first? Yeah, this is, this is the heart of the book. This is sort of the longest section of the book about a man named uh, uh, Charlie uh, Lundu Kunang, um, uh, who is better known uh, as Africa, um, although that was not a name that he ever took for himself, uh, who was uh, an unarmed, uh, houseless, not homeless, but houseless uh, man uh, and Skid Row in Los Angeles, who uh, was uh, held down by a group of uh, LAPD, uh, a special task force that is particularly violent toward uh, the homeless and the houseless, uh, held down by a group of them pinned to the pavement, he's an unarmed man, and uh, he was killed by a contact shot, which is, um, you've heard of point blank, point blank is very close, contact is muzzle to bone. Um, uh, he was shot six times. The shot that killed him was a gun pressed into his chest and he was shot through the heart. Um, and at the time he was killed, um, the LAPD and unfortunately too much of the media sort of went along with this, said, oh, this guy doesn't even really have a name. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a story. Um, and this was 2015, not long after Michael Brown had been killed and Tamir Rice. Um, and, and Eric Garland and uh, Freddie Gray. Um, and there was a way in which um, I felt like they were gonna be nearly successful in erasing Charlie. And I went out there and uh, to Skid Row. And um, anyways, uh, the story was actually sort of moved by, and I've been really pleased to sort of see that when we talk about George Floyd now, I think a lot of us are learning more about who George Floyd was. And, and this essay was actually inspired by uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, Martin Faber had written a short piece and he was saying, too often the media responds to Black Lives Matter by thinking Black death matters. We hear, uh, we only hear about the dead and we don't hear about the lives that were lost. The piece I wrote is the attempt to reconstruct that life. However, tonight I wanna read because of the conversation we're having something from what happened was that the, the officer's body cams and some internal affairs t interviews with them ended up getting leaked to me. And one long night I was able to watch this video again and again and again, very slowly and document it. And I tried to write it as carefully as I could. And I'm gonna share a little part of that. I just won't, I won't, I wouldn't read the killing, but you'll see some of what happens close up. The documentation of Charlie Kunang's last five minutes and 31 seconds begins shortly before officers Martinez and Velasquez arrive. Uh, it begins in the video from Sergeant Saeed's body cam with a survey of a quiet Sunday morning on Skid Row. 
there's the fig tree, the dense canopy. Charlie had chosen this tree to live under. The mission's red wall, a two-story glass cross. There's a flattened tent, a crumpled tarp, a blue tent still standing. That's Charlie's. That was his crime in LA to leave your tent standing in the day is a crime. About five feet away sits a man named LaRue. Our victim supposedly, Sergeant Saeed tells Martinez and Velasquez when they arrive, Charlie is standing between his tent and his milk crate. He's wearing dusty black slacks, a black hoodie tiled in a pattern of Moorish gold and a knit cap, white with a black band. He is not, as they would say, screaming. A woman and two children pass between him and Sergeant Saeed. Hello, says the younger one. Hi, says Saeed. As with Saeed's body cam, there is 30 seconds of silence on the copy of Martinez's body cam video. And we hear birds in the trees. We hear Officer Martinez. He's a buzz cut cop in wraparound shades, barrel chested and barrel bellied. He points at Charlie, points to his own chest and says, you don't tell me how to do my job. Charlie's feet are planted. He is not, as Martinez would say, approaching. There are no fists as they would claim, no screaming. His shoulders are slumped. He gestures toward Martinez with his right hand, open at waist level, as if to say, cool it. But you don't tell a cop to cool it, not even with an open hand. Sergeant Saeed, watching from a distance, says, all right, here we go. Officer Martinez, we're going to do things my way. Charlie tries to say, listen. Martinez says, no, it doesn't work that way. Police on Skid Row and Martinez's mind don't listen. To Officer Velasquez, the rookie, he says, partner, give me your taser. Velasquez, a tall, lean man with an uneasy stance, unholsters a bright green taser and passes it to Martinez. You're going to get tased, Martinez says. You understand? Charlie nods. He says, if you let me express myself, maybe you may have a chance to explain why you're doing this right now. His Cameroonian French accent is crisp, his tone formal. Let me express myself. Let me put this trouble, all of these troubles into words. Sir, the Sergeant Seed, his voice still easy. You're gonna get hurt if you don't comply. This taser's gonna hurt. There's no if about it in Martinez's words. Sir, you're gonna get tased. Charlie turns to Saeed. See, he says, you don't let me express myself. Sergeant Saeed spreads his palms open in front of him. Relax, he says. Martinez starts to speak. Sergeant Saeed gestures at him too. Officer Martinez stops. Can you relax? Sergeant Saeed asks, speaking, it seems, to Martinez as much as to Charlie. Charlie says, let me express myself, Martinez. He knows Martinez's name. A lot of people on Skid Row know Officer Martinez's name. Up against the wall, says Martinez. Let me express myself, Charlie says. What would he have told them had they done so? Doesn't matter now, against the wall. Your job, he says, is to let people express themselves. His dark eyes are large, steady, intent, as if he can stare Martinez into listening. There you go again, Martinez says, against the wall. Are you going to listen, Charlie asks. Sir, this is why you're going to get tased. It's too late. You can go ahead and... Charlie could be saying, kill me, but I can't be sure. Then he says clearly, you can go ahead and tase me. He makes a timeout gesture. He wedges his right foot forward. His left remains in the tent. Behind them, a, trump a crumpled tarp rises from the ground like a blue ghost. A thin woman in capri pants and a beige windbreaker emerges, wanders around the tree to see what's going on. Velasquez pushes her into the street. Skinny little girl, thinks a man watching. What they pushing on her so hard for? Officer Martinez aims the taser. Don't walk up to me, he says. Charlie isn't walking up to him. He's leaning forward, pointing. He moves his right foot forward. His left, remain, his left foot remains in the tent. Martinez says it again. Don't walk up to me. Charlie tries, Saeed. Listen, he says, swinging his gaze around. Tell this guy to stop it. He turns back to Martinez, both hands, palm out, hands held low. You need to stop it right now. And Charlie turns away from the policeman, bends down, crawls into the darkness of his tent and says, leave me alone. Of course, they won't now. It's speeding up. It's going to happen now. It doesn't have to, but it is. 
Saeed tries to talk Charlie out of the tent. Martinez has another idea. Let him in there, he says. Let him in there. He steps in front, aiming the taser. Velasquez follows, gun drawn, held in a side grip, like in a movie, a position the academy would have told him is good for nothing. He's wobbling. Saeed and another sergeant who's arrived peel back the tent, and now there's Charlie on one knee, his arms wrapped around himself. He picks something off the tent floor, something small, a lighter maybe, or a pipe, something smaller than the palm of his hand. A cook at the mission, who saw, thinks it was a flip phone. Charlie pushes down his thighs with his hands and starts to rise. It looks like he's about to put his hands up, but we will never know, because then Martinez's taser beeps twice and the darts fly, and Charlie turns, and this is where it begins, the end. Charlie stands and then spins like a whirlwind, remembers Miss Nika, watching from her corner store. He weaves between two cops, his outstretched arms carrying him full circle. The whirlwind is flapping, his arms, palms open, no fists, no fists, spinning as if he is fighting air. What he is fighting are the taser's wires and the electric current flowing through them. The connection is not complete. Charlie wouldn't be standing if it were, but the darts are hanging onto something and he's tangled in wires. And so he is swinging his arms and he throws down whatever it is in his hand, matches, a lighter, a flip phone, and he begins to twirl. And it went on from there. That's, it's, a, it's a really powerful essay, um, a beautiful book, and I kind of want to just leave it hanging in the silence of the white space. Um, I know it's 647, um, and I know that we were um, wanted to make sure we leave time for if there are any questions. Um, so I guess I'll mention um, at this point that I think the floor is open. Um, if people have questions that um, they would like us to address. Yeah, thanks, Dorothea. Yeah, um, I want to also just give people a little time to um, to let uh, both your readings just resonate a little bit and your conversation, uh, which has been a, a privilege to to listen in on. I I like very much Donovan your description of of of. Uh, Jeff's piece on Charlie as this combination of, of as you, I think you said, elegy, portraiture, and witness. I think there's a lot um, in both of your writing that is at least tribute um, portraiture and witness. I think you both combine those things. Um, the the uh, let me express myself um, since reading since reading that in your book, Jeff. It's 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 joined the I can't breathe in, in my mind um, as an essential expression for, uh, for a demand. And, you know, when Charlie says, your job is to let me express myself. Um, so, but I agree with you, Donovan, we can't do much more in this conversation maybe than to hoist that as a banner um, and, and, uh, and, and leave it there. Maybe as people mull some questions, I see one in the queue. Maybe I can lead us off with something. Um, I sort of linking into when you said, Jeff, that not not only memoir is personal, and maybe one can also flip that and say that the personal can sometimes be improved upon by empty spaces in the map that they draw, right? That it draws. Um, I I wanted to see if you if maybe you could both well let me go to a a a, a spot at the end of your book Donovan um, where you, you you know you end by reflecting on your students' writings um, and you say my students often write sentences that are lovely and even some of their unlovely sentences are moving to me all human lives are poignant when seen intimately but from a distance. And um, you passingly, I think, um, were thinking also, beginning to think, Jeff, about this relationship of, of seeing intimately, but from a distance. And in reading your work, Jeff, I, f I was sometimes reminded of something I feel strongly about Dennis Johnson's work, um, whom I love 
uh, who, whose characters, you know, they are as revealed as they are. There's a sense that Dennis Johnson um, still gives them a kind of surplus of um, uh, of an unknown of, of something unknowable that even to him as as their inventor, right? So um, also a kind of intimacy and distance. And I, I thought of this many times. Um, in reading the portraits of the people that you encounter and accompany um, and want to come to know, but always without intruding in a way that might rob them of something essential. So, so um, it, it, this, all of this just maybe as an invitation to the two of you to, to think a little bit more about um, that delicate balance uh, of the intimate and the distance and the distant. Can, can, can I actually, I want to answer but in, I want to answer by talking about one of Jeff's essays. And since you brought my students into the conversation, I'm going to, yeah. So, so um, there's an essay of Jeff's that I often teach when I'm introducing students to this kind of nonfiction. When, when they come into learning about how to write nonfiction, I think they often assume that it's the, that it's personal personal essay or memoir, it's autobiography. So how the idea of trying to write essay that's artful, that is that has that has the intimacy of a personal essay, but is not directed at the self. I often use an essay of Jeff's um, from and it's it's one in the book. And what I do is I show my students first this oh picture God. of a guy, right? There he is. I don't tell them anything. I just say, look at this picture. And then I have them for five to 10 minutes, just address in their notebooks, the um, answer to the question of what do you see? Just look like, really closely. Look at his, the skull on his t-shirt. He's got headphones, oh, like, but around his neck. Uh, where is he? They recognize the font of Dunkin' Donuts. It's that legible, right? So, so they begin to look really closely. And then we turn to this short portrait, which is gorgeous because it takes us, you, this, this figure in the photograph, he seems intimidating. There's an, there's an aggression to his posture, the shadow in his eye sockets that kind of echoes the skull on his shirt. Some of the students notice his tattoos, right? And speculate. And then you read the portrait and it's heartbreaking when we get to the end of it, right? Because because we learn, we learn about his painting. And I love there's a moment and you include yourself kind of beautifully which is a different thing of how to include the narrator into a work that's not about the narrator. You have the moment where you, when he, he says that he paints and you imagine art, right? For, for a moment in that essay, and then it turns out, no, you know, buildings, right? But then we see, you notice the, the teardrop tattoo, which of course you wonder, and how you arrange those, those details. I just, all the artistry really is the arrangement because it leads to that moment of revelation it is so reminiscent of something you find in the best studs Turkle interviews or Svetlana Alexeyevich interviews, the moment where the person you're interviewing really becomes almost becomes almost a dramatic monologue and it reveals the story behind the tear tattoo, which I'll leave to readers to learn. But that to me is that movement from the impersonal and the distance in that essay. We go from here's a stranger to now I know this person in some really a powerful way. Yeah, let me, I, I want to speak about that. I, I love this idea of, that you have at the end of the book of intimacy and distance. And I think it's maybe there, I, I, you know, we started this conversation by me asking you, like, what is nature writing for people who don't like nature writing? And I think that right there might be part of the answer. Um, because the way I see this playing out in, in, in your work is um, uh, you always afford, whatever, whether it's nature or whether it's a person, whether it's your own mother who you are trying to understand in that powerful, beautiful penultimate essay, Fallen, um, you afford them the sort of the vastness which um, can't quite be comprehended. And I know that you, you, you talked about your early transcendentalist days and I describing this <laughs> book to a friend, I said, this is a book that invokes Thoreau and if you, like me, are not a fan of Thoreau, you will love this book, even though I know that you love Thoreau. And it's like that one moment, I think of the intimacy and distance in the way that you write about water, the way that you write about Flint, Michigan, you come as close as you can and respect what you can't know. 
Um, you go a step further than Thoreau, who climbs the mountaintop of Katahdin, right, to commune with the cosmic and then can't stand it and goes screaming down the mountain, contact, contact. Mm -hmm. You approach more slowly with greater reverence and respect for what's there. And I, and, and I think maybe if you could actually maybe say a word about that centerpiece essay, it's not the centerpiece, it's just in the middle of the book, a zealot, um, which is a profile partly of, uh, of a scientist who was key to discovering lead in the water of, of Flint, and um, which in the context of this book takes on a greater resonance than journalism. You know, you, you explore the sort of the hero narrative and the ways in which people understand themselves. Uh, and, and that, I wonder if you could say something about intimacy and distance with your approach to uh, Mark Edwards. Ah, uh, so I'm gonna try to keep it somewhat brief. I mean, I do think, I think in organizing the books, I thought of the essay that's a, def that's a kind of, a, it is a defense of Thoreau, um, which, I, which I do love him, but I love him in a very conflicted way. And, and I'm really prepared to be a, a, a critic. It's just, I felt that much, you're much better. People are better, better, better than an right here. <laughs> yeah, but there'd been a kind of cartoon version of Thoreau that I really felt like didn't that kind of distorted what he'd actually done and written. So for that case, I felt like I wanted to rescue a figure who'd been turned into a cartoon and um, and at least try to make us think about him in a, in a in a different way. But I think of it almost as the companion piece to the Mark Edwards thing, because I think that the rap against Thoreau that one often hears is that he was a selfish individualist, which I think is a misreading of Thoreau. But I think in Edwards, there are elements of, of, of that libertarian streak, very, I think, American male, that, that well, is- the, the, exactly the, a little bit who, what Edwards did first. So that, that? just explain yeah. so that they know who, who he is. Oh, sorry, yes. So he's, a, he's an engineer from Virginia Tech, and, and I, wanna, I wanna be fair to him too. I really, it's one of my, I really wanna like, there's a, in fact, you know what? This is how I'm gonna answer this. Is, so Edwards was a scientist, um, an engineer, environmental engineer from Virginia Tech, who really deserves credit for having um, um, proven with data to the world that there was a lead and water crisis in DC in the first part of this century at a time when it was being denied. And in DC, the water looked normal and it smelled normal because lead is odorless and invisible. And it really took somebody with a mass spectrometer and a PhD to do it. And he did it while being kind of like, he had to fight some agencies to make that known. So I want to give him his due. In Flint, he, he also deserves credit. He, he, he lent the imprimatur of academic authority to voices in Flint that had been dismissed. That's, I really feel like he came in, he lent the white lab coat. They shouldn't, should have been heard before, should not have been necessary. So in a way it's an indictment of us that we required a figure like this. But he also, I think, plays that part really, like he he's a, he's a, he writes a blog, he self narrates, he's thinking, he thinks a lot about storytelling, he's kind of studied it. And he often will cast a very simple hero villain narrative, good people, bad, bad people. And to me, as a gross simplification of what happened to Flint. If you can't understand the, the history going back decades of, of, of what led to that city's neglect economic and environmental um, and reduce it to it's a little bit like the phrase a few bad apples we're hearing the days to do just a few bad bureaucrats who were to blame it's a huge simplification so uh, I ended up going into that piece why it was signed as a profile and when I got to know him it clearly felt like I needed to complicate the kind of form of the profile and here's where actually I'm, I'm gonna if I may I see we're at the hour I'm gonna end not with my voice I would like to end really quickly with um, somebody else's voice, which is there was a woman who's an environmental justice scholar named Yana Lambernew, um, whom I spent a lot of time talking with. And if I can find it, um, it's just this quote. Uh, and she was, I felt it was brave for her to go on the record at a time when, when at this moment in the story, when that hero narrative had kind of set in. And she says, we are all capable of outstanding courage, even if at times we have been cowards, and of outstanding wrongdoing, even if at times we have been heroes. This is what it means to be human, no? Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be a parent, a teacher, a doctor, a president. We all know that at times we've shined beyond even our own greatest expectations, and at times we have failed spectacularly to, spectacularly to the point of self-shock. I think that Mark, not unlike many individuals and institutions embracing narratives, struggles sometimes to hear this, and maybe we all do.
in the narratives we spin about ourselves. So I let her have the last word. But yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I, um, I, I do want to get to the question in the queue, and I don't think we need to submit to the terror of the clock. Um, people people who want to hop off can do that, and they can come back and finish viewing. And um, uh, this the recording of this will be up on the site, and we'll post it on our uh, YouTube site, too. Um, uh, I love how the two of you, in responding to my question, uh, answered by invoking the other's work, by reading the other's work. <laughs> As you ha and it's been a pleasure just to to um, witness you guys as readers of each other's work. Uh, that's been been really great. The question that is in the queue um, brings us back to to our moment right now. I I learned to only today that uh, in New York City journalists are um, are credentialed by the police. The police approves journalists' credentials. This is what I was told today, which I had not known. That just seems. <laughs> impossible. Um, but the question, it relates to the question that's in the queue here, which is uh, asking you to speak, speak to how journalists have been treated in the last two weeks um, and wondering if you think uh, this will continue or, or it can be reined in, um, what the prospects are um, for what is certainly part of each of your trade. I, I mean, think I, 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 I go you go i mean i do think i do think it's an interesting moment right because uh there's a hero narrative of the journalist actually since we're speaking of hero narratives uh um you know the brave journalist who, who comes back and brings the news and so on and uh i think as the attacks on journalists mount and the last number i saw i think was 328 in this round of protests um uh there's an understandable sense of like, well, wait a minute, why are journalists special? Why do why does the attack on their First Amendment rights matter more than anybody else's? And the answer is it doesn't. Um, what does matter is, um, and it, it's also important to recognize that there's there's always been attacks on journalists. My career began in the Gulf War, taking a picture of a cop beating an old lady and he turned around and punched me. And, and there was a hero narrative. Everyone dragged me on a bus, arrested me, got my camera away everyone thought that i had like i had the goods and so on but i had actually forgotten this was film i'd forgotten to put film in the camera <laughs> um, and uh you know and that, that's always going on in the charlie story i i got i got, also got pushed up against the wall um that's always going on special with 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 smaller independent journalists this moment that's happening right now is when you see a cnn crew arrested live on camera, that becomes narrative, right? That's a narrative moment. And you have to sort of think, okay, if this is what's happening on camera, what's happening off camera? I do think that matters, um, that matters tremendously. Um, and, and this credentialing question is interesting because I think, Donovan, the only time I've ever actually bothered with or been credentialed is on the one piece we worked together on, on together, uh, um, and that was dealing with- uh, Harper's. Yeah, and, and and Uganda and dealing with sort of government figures who you really had to go in with official permission, um, uh, but and and they use that credentialing actually there as a way of control, and so we might sort of think about that now as as we're trying to reform everything, right? And not reform, radicalize everything. Maybe credentials should go out the door too. Maybe we should just be writers, not heroes, right. not investigative journalists, just writers scribbling on the margin. Wit witnesses, I think, is good. I like it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, and I think, think I agree all of that. I'm glad you spoke to it. That sounds exactly right. And and yet, at the same time, I think that the the ways, the audacity, the on camera audacity, with which both the federal government and local governments have displayed, knowing that cameras are rolling that aggression towards journalists is is chilling um and, oh, and that's um, what i mean when i say it's, it's happening on yes. camera now in a way it's one thing to push a print journalist up against the wall it's another on a live cnn feed you know that's that's that is a that is an act of terror and that is meant to be scary and i just actually come you know i've got a piece coming yes. out about trump rallies and the way that trump uses cnn as the villain 
And so when we see that as terror, there's other people who look at this as, well, that's the best Trump campaign ad I ever saw. But to be aware that the cops are doing narrative too, right? Their yes. story coming too. And um, yeah, it's become a spectacle, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a dark, we, we had a good moment before. We got to, we can't end on I that. I know, it's okay, well, you know, it's okay, but it's a dark time. First of all, I, I, I agree. I, th I think as long as we're thinking together, it's a good moment. Um, and, and second of all, maybe we give Charlie the last word on this also, because uh, fundamentally there too, it's a question of, of letting them express themselves. Um, uh, so, so maybe we give Charlie the last word um, in, in, this, in this conversation. And that leaves me to thank you uh, for, for spending this time with us and to invite everyone who's tuned in um, to read these uh, extraordinary books see them, the objects, the inner coast, this brilliant darkness, um, beautiful book with extraordinary photos. We didn't talk about the fact that Jeff is also a remarkable photographer. You'll encounter him as that um, when you pick up, pick up that book. Uh, I really wish we were going to dinner next. Um, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a strange moment of, of falling into the void when we all just uh, sign off. Um, but at the same time, I'm grateful that uh, we were able to come together in this in this virtual way. And I wish um, both of you, I wish all of you uh, a good night um, uh, as you return to, to your tasks and uh, we all return to, to facing the world and hopefully trying to shape it together into something it, it, it isn't yet. So uh, take care, everyone. I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks to all who came. Yeah. Bye. Bye.